Freshwater, the Society for Freshwater Science. Yay! Elected, we're the elected officers, our first and probably only elected positions. Um, so I first want to just say a shout out to our um, friends and neighbors and colleagues in the North Bay and for us to really be thinking about as a, as, as our, in our work and uh, moving forward like socially, economically, and environmentally. We have a lot of work to do in the coming months and years and so let's um, just want to really give a shout out to what they've been through up there. So um, just keep them in your minds. So um, now let's move on to this. If you know what this photo is, you probably are 1.1% of anybody in the country that does. Um, the first time I encountered such a thing was at a, a NABS conference, which is the North American Benthological Society, which is now the Society for Freshwater Science. I wonder why we changed the name. Um, back in Pittsburgh in 2002 and met these vendors that had aquariums that had caddisflies in them and they were colored rocks and little jewels and they were making, you know, jewelry out of these amazing um, cases. And um, so it's one of these things that, is, that really blew my mind. And so I have tried this experiment at um, gatherings with casual acquaintances that I see every now and again, you know. Tell them about a little uh, larvae of a certain fly that make little cases when they live on the bottom of the rivers and that some people make jewelry out of these things and put little jewels and such in them. And it's a really fun party trick to tell people about that. Um, then, and, and to watch their um, response. What's going on? Do you guys feel it? Okay. So um, then, then, then you explain to them that freshwater pearls come from freshwater mussels and really watch people's heads explode. And so I've had these conversations, like I said, with friends of mine who refer to my occupation as a riverologist. And so it, it's really fun to see what happens. Um, it goes from pure disbelief to kind of like, oh, you must be crazy to a point of pure wonder. And that's really what happened to me the first time I went to a, a conference about aquatic ecosystems. I really felt like I had found my people. Um, really felt like I had entered a society where the charismatic me charismatic megafauna were the little pandas of the streams, the freshwater mussels, and you know dragonflies and caddisflies. So it was like this amazing moment. So. Um, that's what the Fresh Society for Freshwater Science means to me. So I just want to give you an introduction to the Society for Freshwater Science. So it's an international organization that really the goal is to promote an understanding of freshwater ecosystems and ecosystems at the interface of the freshwater and terrestrial habitats. And the society fosters this exchange of scientific information among um, the membership, professional societies, resource managers, academic and the public and um, one thing that I really like about the society is that it is um, focused around policy as well taking policy positions so advocates for the best um, available science to actually be informing policy or at least commenting on policy and one thing this past year they've signed you know two letters have been signed letters to the EPA um, around the revisions of the waters um, to the US which is quite cool. So the history of the society, it was previously known as the North American Benthological Society, founded in 1953 with 13 um, members who kind of chartered this um, and original focus was on stream um, insect ecology. Currently it's an international organization with around 1800 members and 50 countries um, represented and really it's a commitment again to this interdisciplinary exchange and mentorship of and also mentorship of young scientists. Um, there is some, the great publication, the journal Freshwater Science which used to be JNABS um, is a great resource and there's an annual meeting every year. I'm sure a lot of you go to it. Um, this, this year's is going to be in Detroit in May, um, which could be kind of fun to go to. I haven't been for a while. I might go. Um, and so this is California. We actually have a chapter here, which is great. Um, and the focus is, it was established in 2014. Um, most of the members are current participants in, in this workshop in CABW. 
Again, the focus is on bioassessment, stream ecology, and taxonomy, and the funds that are generated from the uh, society, our chapter, have been used to support students um, to travel to conferences and scholarships. And we currently have 70 members, which is pretty good. Um, I'm happy about it. So if you're interested in joining us, um, we'd really love you to join. Um, it's really inexpensive. It's $10 to be a member of the California chapter of the Society for Freshwater Science. Um, that That is in addition to being a member of the, the parent society, which membership ranges from $40 to $90. But with that, you get the great journal, you get um, discounts to the annual meeting, and um, uh, participation in student awards. So that's just a little bit about the society. Now let's talk about today, today and tomorrow. Um, today, we have four great talks. We're going to have things from fish to herbs plants, big rivers, dry rivers. It's going to be really fun to hear um, from various researchers. And we have 10 talks tomorrow, which will be fun too. So please join us for that. Um, we have an annual business meeting today right after this uh, session ends, which is at 4 o'clock. And please join us if you're a member. Please join us if you're thinking about being a member. Um, it'll just be an hour and we'll talk about kind of what we want to do in the coming year, what we've accomplished the past year. And as um, Jesse mentioned earlier, we're having a happy hour tonight at Blondie's, which is um, at uh, on G Street, 300 something G Street. And some of the uh, the funds will go to um, Cal SFS, which is great. The Blondies is dedicating some of that. So it'll be a good time to go out and have a cocktail and maybe something to eat and chat about stream ecology. Um, also tomorrow, which is great, we're having a, a workshop on eDNA. And so I want to bring up um, John to tell you a little bit about that. And um, thanks and talk to you soon. Thanks, Jeanette. So uh, last year we did a workshop as part of this meeting. We're looking at eco-hydrology, and we had about 20 people in attendance. This year we wanted to have another uh, workshop, and we're talking about what to do. We decided to look at environmental DNA. It's an up-and-coming topic. Maybe not a lot of people know a lot about it. This would be a good chance to inform some people. Uh, so the audience we're really looking for are people that you know really don't know much about environmental DNA. So this was basically a primer for somebody who's heard of it maybe, but you've never really dealt with it before. Or if you are a practitioner in environmental DNA, you're so, certainly welcome to attend, but it might be uh, below what you're necessarily wanting to get. Um, we are providing it free, although we're asking for donations. So uh, students are not expected to donate. But if you are a, a non-member, we're asking for $30 uh, to help come. So I will be out and uh, collecting registrations tonight uh, after the meeting is complete at 5 o'clock. I'll stick around for about half an hour and collect uh, registrations. I'll be here tomorrow morning also to collect registrations. Um, and if there's any questions, I'll, t I'll be happy to answer them at the time. Okay. Right, great. So that gives you a kind of an idea of, of the, the next couple of days. Um, so we have some nice talks coming up. Um, our first speaker is going to be um, Parsa Serafina. And he is a PhD um, student uh, at UC Riverside. His general research interest is in the role of flow disturbance on benthic community dynamics. Um, He's done most of his work in the Santa Ana Rivershed um, at the, at the, and the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Lab. Let's hear it for the UC Natural Reserve System. Yes! Woo! So, let me bring up Parsa and we'll go from there. Oh, one other thing. We're going to switch. Um, Ann Willis's talk is going to be at 3.15. She's changing places with Alex and then Alex will be at Alex and Joanna at 3.30. So just that's a little switch in the agenda. Okay, thanks. Cool. All right, hi everyone, I'm Parsa. <clears throat> 
Uh, I'm a PhD student. My advisor is Kurt Anderson at UC Riverside. So I wanted to start a talk off today uh, with a, uh, a, a hydrograph that sort of synthesizes some flow models that have been circulating for the past couple of years. Uh, this was adapted uh, from some work Dave Herbst has done. And so um, this black line here kind of synthesizes a historical hydrograph. And this gray one here is more of a current and expected uh, flow conditions in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. And I just want to highlight some things from, from uh, this projected hydrograph here. So we have these rain on snow floods that we uh, have been realizing for a while now uh, in the winter time. Uh, we have these uh, wetter and more erratic winter flows. We have a shift in, uh, to a peak in uh, snow melt to earlier in the year. Uh, and we have earlier in prolonged summer low flows. We have this uh, drying of perennial streams. Uh, I know some other people are going to talk about this later today. I've done some work on this. It's snarled, but um, a shift in flow regime from perennial to intermittent. Uh, and you know, these kinds of uh, shifts have implications toward the community assembly and food web dynamics in our aquatic systems. Uh, and the ones I really want to highlight are uh, changes in environmental process, uh, environmental conditions, whereby when you have a drying stream, you have uh, altered temperature cycle, dissolved oxygen cycle, and just cuts in dispersal ability. So these drying events uh, lead to uh, habitat constriction, which is also really important. So we kind of have these niche based and dispersal based disturbances, and I'm going to try to frame this talk in that light. So flow has kind of been considered considered a master variable for several decades now, and it's kind of the centerpiece of uh, my research. And so like I said, I'm really interested in the shift of flow regimes and how that influences communities. Um, and so the picture on the left here is Strawberry Creek in the San Bernardino Mountains about nine years ago. Uh, here on the right hand side is Strawberry Creek um, three years ago, same time of year. Uh, so these are the kind of radical shifts that we're realizing in um, many of our historically perennial streams. Uh, Oh, and I kind of just wanted to get a census here. Uh, who loves uh, Nestle bottled water? <laughs> Raise your hand if you do. Oh, one person. All right. Uh, well, uh, this the this is where Nestle bottles their water. Um, this picture on the right hand side uh, is kind of what they they've been dealing with. They've been working on a several decade long expired permit uh, in uh, Forest Service land, and we're trying to gain attention on this uh, catastrophe, really. And so, uh, please uh, think about that next time you buy Nestle bottled water. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, uh, projects have been sort of focused on this alpha diversity framework, which has been great. It's really taught us a lot. Um, I'm kind of trying to work on uh, the beta diversity framework for this talk. So here's just a quick uh, snapshot of, of some of the data I've been working with. This is South Lake Tahoe, El Dorado County. Uh, you can see some of these sites that I did not sample um, are at different elevations, uh, different spatial scales, and uh, these all have implications toward the functioning of our systems at the catchment scale. So uh, here's another snapshot of uh, some data I've been looking at. Uh, this is uh, richness on an uh, elevational contour plot. So the, the lighter the colors or the redder the colors, uh, the higher the richness, uh, the cooler or the bluer, the lower the richness. So we see some patterns here uh, in South Lake Tahoe. And here is uh, another quick snapshot of the data. This is um, percent endemism, you could call it, by stream order. And so there is some endemism expressed in, in this catchment that I'm talking about. Um, but what's driving these patterns? That's what I'm really curious about. What, what, why, why, why is this stuff happening? So uh, to kind of get at that, I like to scale up, right, to look at, to look at old catchments. So uh, here's a, a NASA picture that ran through the LA Times a couple years ago, right, um, of uh, shifts in snowpack. And so what I like, how I like to think about it is, you know, what's happening throughout the Sierra Nevada mountains at these different catchments, and um, how can we analyze uh, relationships
relationships of beta diversity to flow perturbations and other environmental variables at these larger spatial scales. So the purpose of this talk, I define beta diversity as variation in community structure among a set of sample units within a given spatial temporal context. All right, so this leads to the basic study question of this project. Um, which flow-related environmental processes and or spatial scales best predict community turnover in the Sierra Nevada? Uh, this is kind of a lofty goal and um, so I, I, I have not answered this question uh, quite yet with this talk, but I'm trying to get there and uh, I'm gonna show you some preliminary analyses. So uh, how do we study aquatic communities in light of perturbations? Well, we know that BMIs are great, EPTs are awesome, um, and uh, functional trait niches are a great way to go uh, when we're looking at uh, uh, responses of communities to perturbations. So that's another avenue I've taken with my work. Um, uh, in this project, uh, pretty much the methods that uh, we used, uh, we formed a database, we did some ordinations, and we employed variation partitioning techniques to link environmental and spatial variables at uh, larger scales. So how did we do this? Uh, this is kind of my connection to this uh, meeting is uh, uh, I utilize the CETA network uh, and swamp data uh, for this project. So, um, yeah. And then uh, I utilized a bunch of gauge data for my flow variables uh, and assembled a bunch of predictors from various databases. And uh, for this study, uh, I focused uh, uh, in uh, Lower Lake Tahoe, and the idea is to kind of start here and hopefully scale up to other catchments once we kind of nail down a protocol. So this is pretty much where uh, the sites are uh, for the uh, purpose of this talk. And um, just going through some uh, preliminary data here. Um, this is uh, temperature variation among sites. Uh, so there's some variability here. We have some cooler areas, some warmer areas. Um, this is uh, uh, 30 year coefficient of variation. So what I did was I pulled 30 years of flow data, uh, daily flow data, and then I calculated a coefficient of variation uh, over those that 30 year time span um, to kind of contextualize uh, the hydrograph uh, to the uh, swamp data that we pulled uh, from these different sites. So uh, how do we analyze beta diversity where we, uh, we use the Bray Curtis method to calculate beta diversity and then conducted a distance based uh, redundancy analysis uh, to partition the environmental and spatial variables. Uh, so this is what the results are gonna look like when I present them. We're gonna have this Venn diagram sort of thing. Um, the green circle is gonna be the proportion of variation explained by the environment. The blue is uh, pure space. So anything in uh, the numbers in the blue circle are essentially, you know, what uh, that uh, anything that space describes completely, and then the intersection of the two is uh, structurally, uh, spatially structured environmental variables. Um, and obviously, we have unexplained uh, variation as we do usually with these analyses. So this is what we found so far. Um, uh, pure environment explains about 3%. Uh, pure space explains about 4%. Uh, and spatially uh, structured environmental variables explain about uh, 15 or so. So um, we're not explaining too much of the variation right now going on uh, in the uh, catchment with this procedure. Uh, but uh, this was done using a taxonomic method, so we're not using traits uh, in this slide and um, actually this is kind of usually what people get using this method so we're not too far off uh, and the significant environmental variables we found were elevation stream order and the uh, coefficient of flow variation so just to kind of dive deeper into the, those results, um, on the left-hand side here, we have a non-metric uh, multidimensional scaling ordination of uh, sites uh, in low and high elevation uh, areas. And uh, when we do a permutation F-test on the PCOA of, of uh, those data, we find a significant difference. So um, 
So there is something going on here, and the environmental variables are definitely important in dictating the, the patterns that we're seeing. So, so what do these results mean? Well, we know that uh, these spatially structured environmental processes are, are most important from this first uh, sort of preliminary pass. Uh, so we know species sorting uh, could be uh, explaining some of the variation that we're seeing. Um, and unstructured spatial effects seem weak so far, so pure space is not really dictating uh, much of what we're finding. Uh, so what am I doing right now? Well, coefficient of variation is an interesting metric, but um, as uh, we know, there are a, a lot of different aspects of the hydrograph that could be um, sort of dictating the patterns that we're seeing. So um, I'm using uh, some uh, techniques to uh, find which aspects of the hydrograph are most predictive of the patterns we're seeing. Uh, so that's kind of the direction I want to take with this project. Uh, and using in stream distances and functional turnover. So uh, Andy sent me a, 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 a database of uh, traits exhibited by most swamp taxa that have been identified. Uh, and I'm working on a clustering analysis to uh, sort of group the traits that we're finding into um, certain interesting uh, uh, communities. And then uh, what we're doing is looking for which traits are most uh, related to the environmental variables. And then we're going to redo this variation partitioning analysis with those significant traits uh, against the environmental variables to see what's going on. Uh, so the overall mission for this project, uh, which we really haven't quite addressed yet, is you know how can we address the problem of changing flow regimes? Um, and uh, hopefully, with the help of a lot of collaborators and some more sort of fine-tuned work with the uh, SWAMP data set, we can start to understand which aspects of the flow regime are dictating the patterns that we're seeing. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, all the people that have helped with this project. Um, it's taken some time uh, learning about the way SWAMP works and the way the database works and sort of organizing the data. And um, I'd really like to thank uh, everyone on this list uh, for their help so far. And uh, stay tuned. Thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.